First and foremost is that relationship um, back to Orchard Road that I'm keen to ask you about. Um, <clears throat> I think you talked about uh, some of the developments and projects that you've done and how they actually have connected places to each other. And for example, Horton Plaza, if I recall correctly, starts from the CBD and ends up in the gas lamp or historic quarter of San Diego. So actually it connects old and new. <clears throat> but if you talk about Orchard Road, what does it connect? It's a road. So does it have that same connectivity? That's the first comment I want to get out of you. Uh, the second comment that you mentioned and in your, I think, many examples, uh, you showed the complexity of cities and the issue of parallel layered streets of different activities and a lot of side streets that connect these parallel streets uh, forming actually walking loops. And you mentioned the examples of Barcelona, Causeway Bay, Shanghai, uh, Melbourne, and these small in situ spaces that actually uh, create that imagery and uh, I think longevity in people's minds. So I'd like you also to comment on that idea and perhaps apply it to Orchard Road, which is actually, uh, again, a single road. Um, third idea that you mentioned was this idea of creating community and urban villages around uh, the core uh, shopping malls or retail districts and a mix of activities vertically as well. Uh, I noticed very interestingly the fact that you had identified three areas of Orchard Road. What if we reconceptualize these three areas as urban villages? How would that change the landscape of Orchard Road? So just three questions to start you off. The, the simple thing right now, if, if we start with a very small idea, is that uh, because of technology, the, the, the format of the way that, that stores actually work um, it, uh, becomes highly significant. Um, because it's, it, you know, in, in the future or in the near future, um, I think a lot of landlords are going to have difficulty figuring out a way to charge rent. Um, and that's because it's not going to be uh, traditionally based on um, turnover, for instance. Uh, there's a lot of people who, are, who will use physical properties, uh, who will want the best experiences that, that stores actually have to offer, uh, but they're going to make, be making their purchases elsewhere or online. But the two are completely co-related. So uh, what we've started to do is to, uh, in looking at uh, the retail portion of mixed use, is uh, really to try to uh, design in adaptive spaces, uh, because uh, even today, and certainly a year or two from now, uh, we can't actually predict uh, what kind of formats will actually work. Um, and so the, the idea that uh, a kind of mixture of traditional rents with something that is, is uh, programmed to constantly adapt is really part of the idea that we're, we're promoting. Um, I don't know how, how successful they are, but in Hong Kong there's a, well, I think they're New York and Hong Kong, uh, there's an outfit called uh, Storefront who are doing uh, permanent pop-up places, um, and as um, you know, some of you uh, uh, landlords, uh, you might actually be uh, taking up a huge amount of space of former department stores um, and actually offering it up for them. And what they'll do is they'll bring in uh, two to three hundred pop-up operators, unique products that they source from around the world, um, and make it part of your permanent collection, so that. Constant change and the idea of change, I think, it is really what's uh, highly sig significant. So for us, uh, that along with the way that um, the workplace environment is changing so significantly and the desirability of people to, to want to live in urban villages, those three combined actually means that there's an, a tremendous number of ingredients uh, that we can actually use to reprogram and redesign spaces. Right. Um, I think... Uh, Answered my question in part, but indirectly. In, indirectly. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> deliberately. <laughs> um, but you know, I'm going to push you for the yes. application of your, your ideas to Orchard Road. The, the, um, the, uh, the earlier comment also that, that Orchard Road doesn't really connect anything, um, I kind of agree. Um, I don't know that, frankly, Orchard Road, or given the, the, the way that uh, Singapore infrastructure works, will actually truly connect one part of the city to the next. Um, the way I tend to conceptualize Orchard Road is that it is a district and a precinct. It just simply happens to be linear. Uh, I think you can uh, hit it at any of the individual points, 
Uh, but conceptually, you should sort of squash it so that it's essentially a squarish or circular kind of site uh, and deal with it as a kind of precinct. Because I think that's the, the difficulty with, with thinking about it as a linear street is, again, this idea that you walk, you enter into a fortress-like project, you experience it, and then you get out. And when you look across, very difficult to get to, or you already know that the next project has a very similar kind of offer. So without these pr programmatic kind of changes, I think it's difficult to continue to entice people along, especially when it's difficult to walk. Well, I, I think I'd like to draw a parallel to what you also mentioned about the work you're doing in Bangkok. Uh, Sukhumvit Road, for all intents and purposes, is very similar to Orchard Road. It's a linear shopping strip, and you have shopping mall after another. But yet, when you get out at each station along Bangkok, along Sukhumvit Road, you feel that each station has depth and breadth because each station is actually part of a local village which has connectivity from the main street into the side streets. Maybe your comment on that. No, I, I think that's the porosity that, that uh, Bangkok has been able to achieve along um, Sukhumvit Road. Um, I think that's absolutely accurate. Um, the other part I, which I, I always find completely fascinating about Bangkok is that they have awesome retail. I mean, some, somehow the conditions there have pushed each of the individual owners to push for unique concepts. So along Sukhumvit Road, for instance, um, uh, even though it's a very long road, uh, you could spend all day exploring different kind of uh, places. Emporium is totally different from Central, uh, the 21 Project, et cetera. So you can get five, six completely different type of experiences, different kind of offers where you're encouraged to actually explore. Um, and again, I, I think the, 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 uh, the continuing narrowness of the market in Orchard Road uh, is difficult in terms of, uh, of uh, enticing people to come and continue to explore. And now the big question I'm gonna to pose to you, and if I don't pose it now, somebody from the audience will do so. Um, there's been a lot of talk in the press recently and a lot of um, public uh, have been writing in about whether to pedestrianize Orchard Road or part of it. So, what's your view towards that? Uh, what's your view? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 um, I, I'm, I'm agnostic as to whether it should be pedestrianized or not pedestrianized. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in uh, trying to understand the changes to transport and technology. Um, I, I tend to think that uh, although it would be fantastic to uh, create a pleasure garden out of it, for instance, and I think it would work well, um, there's no need to do that if you're doing things correctly. Uh, you don't need five lanes on Orchard Road. You need one. And the rest could be carved up, and not necessarily in a linear way, uh, in a series of, of uh, uh, areas for gathering uh, performances, events, uh, even retail uh, uh, F and B. So I think it really requires a combination, and that really is about the way that all of us are going to to behave uh, differently down the road. Um, I know cars are not that prevalent in Singapore, uh, but it's going to be even less so. Um, they will be around. You you have driverless cars already, which actually means that most of that traffic uh, is unnecessary. You know, is that is that next year or five years? But certainly not, nothing beyond that. So I think that's what you have to start planning for. Uh, my name's Jack Backen from Sistry. Um, I just have a question. We, we talk about um, reimagining Orchard Road, and I just wonder about your view of extending that to actually a broader definition. It's not just Orchard Road we're talking about. We're actually talking about something bigger than that. Well, <clears throat> uh, Orchard Road's simply the model that, that we're using to discuss the point. Uh, I think we're really uh, talking about the transformation of cities right now, where um, uh, it's really kind of uh, part of a historical continuum in a way. Um, if you think about mainland China, for instance, everything has happened in the last 20 years. Um, in Singapore, it would have been about 40, 40 years, but it's all based on models that were established uh, a long time ago. Um, and if you think about the fact that in order to be sustainable, these assets actually exist, but there's so many different ways of exploring the way our cities are evolving, and in particular, the way we are all kind of evolving. Um, and I think that's really what we're talking about. So yes, it's Orchard Road. Uh, it can continue to extend. It can go higher. It can get more dense. But I think it really requires reprogramming. Hi. Uh, Mark Shaw. I'm a 
chairman of the Orchard Road Business Association and from Shaw House, which is where that photo was taken, on our, on our plaza, so on the hardscape. Um, you know, I mean, just even looking at that picture, there's only one apartment building that you can actually see in that. Uh, the rest of Orchard Road tend to be, you know, malls and offices. So judging by, you know, what you said earlier on about uh, the proliferation of co-working space, do you think that a lot of these offices should be converted into, you know, residential to bring life back to the street? And, um, and you know, maybe some of the mall spaces should become large co-working, more lifestyle-based uh, environments. It's probably a little bit unfair to say that half of the uh, retail-based projects uh, on Orchard Road uh, could go through this kind of transformation. Um, I'm sure financially a lot of them are uh, much more successful than it may appear to an outsider like, like me. Um, but uh, part of the issue, I think, about creating a neighborhood, because that's really what we're talking about, is you have to have a diversity of audiences who have different needs. So I don't think it's just residences, but I think definitely um, uh, different types of residences, particularly I would say for this type of audience of people who would want to live on top of these types of buildings rather than uh, in the suburbs, I think the demand is definitely there. Um, in, um, at a similar kind of scale, there's a few things that we're working on where uh, there's an, a, quite a bit of interest from um, senior citizens uh, because uh, they do not want to live out um, in um, uh, managed care areas, which is devoid of life. They're very active, very healthy, and they want the vitality of living in this kind of community. So um, I think there are other kinds of residences that actually uh, definitely are desirable. Um, I'm really um, uh, big on the workplace environments because, again, between the workplace uh, and the residences, we're talking about activation. You know, uh, people who are interested and invested into these communities. So I think they all kind of work. Um, I, I know that um, um, along Orchard Road, you do have an issue because you have a lot of expensive uh, apartments and homes right next to it who probably don't want to connect so fluidly. Um, but uh, there, uh, I don't know if it's a planning uh, code issue, but I think you have a lot more opportunity to create towers, and, and those rules may change down the line. Uh, Sanford from GSS. Just on the issue of what is Orchard Road is uh, connected to, from a kind of pedestrian or scooter or cyclist perspective, it, it's actually physically proximate to, to areas like the Civic District, Clark Key, uh, the, the, the Marina Bay area. So if you think of, of Orchard Road as not just distinct Orchard Road or street, but, but what, what it could flow to, it's... it's it could actually lead to, to parts of Singapore that would be an enjoyable full day, six hour experience. And, and, and just right now, the, the, the connection, the, the connection points are not, uh, not particularly seamless and it's, it's not a very pleasant walk. So, so any ideas on, on how you connect to a, to a more diverse part beyond just strictly Orchard Road? If we go micro again, a little bit, just about Orchard Road. Um, what, one of the things I, I noticed the last couple of trips is that you guys now have um, uh, elevated bridges to connect across the street. I don't like that idea <laughs> um, I, I, because I, I think it creates kind of a weird problem. Um, in, in the central business district of Hong Kong, they have elevated bridges that, that work. It's an incredibly uh, dense, compact kind of area where uh, because it was already badly planned in terms of accommodating too much uh, vehicular traffic, it was sort of a secondary solution that Hong Kong land uh, took advantage of, and they've done it well in terms of creating that uh, level of connectivity. Um, but that part of Hong Kong also is sloped. So in some areas, it's actually ground plane, and then you're actually elevating across um, uh, essentially highways. So I think there's kind of a logic to that. Um, Orchard Road, to me, um, has to focus on two layers, and that is uh, building around the MRT stations and just really maximizing that as much as possible. But it's really the, the ground plane which is what you have to focus on. Uh, the elevated connections uh, seems like it would make it convenient, but I think what it'll do is it'll dissipate uh, crowds and people and get them away from where you want them to be. I mean, if this was kind of the crowd at every uh, significant corner of Orchard Road, I think it would be fantastic, right? You'd, you'd want to be there and you'd want to hang out. Um, 
by taking people to a third layer, I think you actually remove that sense of community and excitement. So I, I wouldn't really do that. Um, I know I didn't really answer your, your broader kind of question. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, it's a little bit, uh, the, uh, in terms of scale, uh, it's always been, for me anyways, uh, interesting that although Singapore is one of the greenest cities that I've ever actually been to, it's not the most walkable city I've ever been to. So the issue for me there is that if you want to connect Orchard Road to the Singapore River or Marina Bay Sands, uh, it's going to require more than just uh, lining it with trees. Uh, it requires activation. You know, really, really for us, we work in principles about half a kilometer, um, and you cannot really have too many breaks within a half kilometer stretch in order to continue to uh, encourage and entice people to, to walk through. And I think that's one of the issues that you're going to um, uh, face in Singapore. You have pretty vast stretches where actually there's very little ability to add program um, to it. So uh, I don't know how to solve that, um, but I'll think about it. Hi, um, my name's Katiana from Center for Livable Cities. I just have a question about the earlier point you made about the tipping point for authenticity in some of the districts you've seen when larger commercial complexes or companies move in and local independent businesses move out. I wonder what examples you have of specific strategies that cities have adopted that have been successful in helping to maintain that diversity of retail mix and the authenticity of some of these districts. In, in Hong Kong, there's a few projects like um, Island Beverly. Um, I, I would say Shibuya 109 in Tokyo also is a really interesting one that probably a few of you have been to. Um, and what we took some inspiration from that when we were conceptualizing um, our Mong Kok project. Uh, what those projects uh, did so well was um, it, uh, they identified a gap in the market um, and uh, in Tokyo uh, about 15 years ago and in Hong Kong about 10 years ago, uh, what they were trying to do was take advantage of the, the cheap and fast manufacturing in southern China. Uh, a lot of young designers uh, who did not want to work in traditional fields, and that's much more extreme today than it was 10 or 15 years ago, um, and um, a kind of identification of a gap in the market where people in their teens to 25 uh, did not really have uh, the right kind of uh, fashion offer at the right kind of price. So what both projects did was uh, they stacked uh, these 10, 15 level uh, buildings, put in about uh, six, seven shops per floor. Um, it, uh, nothing was done with uh, any kind of high degree of, uh, of detail. It's very casual, um, very quickly done. Uh, and uh, they probably pay as high rent as something like Pacific Place in Hong Kong because they drive traffic to their shops every week. Um, and if you think about it, it's a really sim simple thing. Uh, every uh, one to two weeks, they do a limited run of, of these fashion goods, and when they sell out, that's it. They, they never do it again. And so it's that, that sense that you're owning something which is affordable, but one of a kind that really represents who you are. And so I think there are those kind of programmatic ideas that, that will begin to fill these gaps. Um, I kind of have a feeling that, that uh, to a certain degree, I think Far East Plaza, uh, there's some elements uh, of that. Um, but I think, you know, unless you're really dedicated um, for that kind of use, it's a little bit hard to find compared to what's uh, directly along uh, Orchard Road. But uh, the the kind of DNA, uh, DNA diagrams that, that I was showing you, I think that's the way to really begin to break down to see what actually does not exist um, in the Singapore market and, and begin to fill that in. So I'd just like to take up that point <clears throat> and just perhaps uh, bring this discussion a little further because you talked about taking the big box and you talked about breaking it down and creating urban villages and communities. communities. And I think you've illustrated that in your sections for Sydney and how you have created vertical communities through a high layering of mix of users. But I'd also like to draw also upon, say, new developments uh, like PMQ in Hong Kong and other developments, uh, say, in Brooklyn, in, in New York, whereby you see the prevalence of makers and creators and retailers all in the same building. But yet, the zoning codes in Singapore, we don't 
uh, kind of allow it because if you make, you go to industrial zones. If you, go, if you create, you might go to a business one zone and if you retail, you go to a commercial zone. So how do you, in your experience worldwide, how do you overcome such zoning restrictions and make places for makers, re, uh, creators, retailers, office workers and residential uh, people to, to actually be in the same area? Yeah, you, you should change that. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think you have to go as far as uh, like Houston, which effectively doesn't have any um, zoning laws, so it, it organically can create this. Um, but um, in, in Asia, it's, uh, it's kind of a, uh, a blend of uh, public-private kind of partnerships because uh, the, uh, I, I work um, mostly for private developers, uh, not governments. Um, and um, at the scale, the projects that we work um, under the more enlightened ones or the ones who understand the competitive aspect of uh, having a project which can continue to evolve are now creating areas because that is desirable for specific audiences to participate in, to see. It also lends a, a unique flavor for a project um, in terms of its programming and experiences that other typical projects actually cannot offer. So it's really becoming part of a permanent program part of a permanent offer. The, um, uh, I, I mean, I think about my daughter a little bit because um, you know, she's a smart girl, but she's gonna be one of those people who will live and breathe uh, these kind of communities. She's not going to uh, get the highest scores in mathematics and chemistry and science, uh, but she's highly creative and she's only 13 right now, but she already knows specifically the kind of things that she wants to do. Um, I mean, when a lot of us were growing up, we didn't have those kind of options. You know, we were very narrow in terms of what we could do, what we could offer. Um, and when we began to practice, uh, essentially that system perpetuated itself. Uh, I think that's all gonna change down the line. Um, and the idea of having um, uh, a permanent flexibility, permanent adaptability, uh, permanent creativity, the idea of crafts, taking unique positions, um, and having malls which actually effectively have no stores, that that's all being worked on now. I mean, I've had the pleasure of working on a Jody project in Singapore, which unfortunately was never realized. Uh, for those of you that didn't know, uh, Jody partnership was actually, uh, or actually planned the Hubfront Mall before it actually morphed into its current entity. And you had planned it, I think, with a canal going through, with streets flowing through, with small scale versus large scale, with parks on the roof. And I think it was uh, quite a microcosm of what uh, you have uh, illustrated in your slides. But to bring some of these ideas to Orchard Road, what if I say, let's bring Namba Parks to all the roofs or podiums of Orchard Road. Let's bring Santa Monica Place, which is actually fine grain development that they've done in Santa Monica in Los Angeles, to the backs and sides of Orchard Road to extend that uh, porosity. Let's bring the idea of circular key and Langham Place vertical programming to Orchard Road. And, you know, and let's bring Chelsea Market to Orchard Road. What, what do you think of this imagery of the combination of uh, Jody Partnerships work would have upon Orchard Road? Yeah, I, I would hang out there. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's, um, it, it's sort of, for me, beyond um, taste. Um, you know, what, what kind of uh, place do I want to be in? Um, I think what you just described is um, a kind of recipe for uh, evolution, that, that it's a precinct in a neighborhood that will always evolve, always will take advantage of uh, small things that actually make experiences in life really great for people. Um, uh, you, you can capture, you know, sometimes in a huge singular moment in a huge project, uh, something which is, uh, has that kind of vitality, but it's extremely hard. Um, and it's not something that you can do in Orchard Road right now. But your advantage is that you have you know, 30 to 40 properties, uh, each of which can take a position. Um, and maybe you will lead the discussion so that there's, uh, the, uh, within each of those individual buildings, they begin to break open itself so that it attaches integrally to what is happening in the public realm of, of Orchard Road, that people can fluidly move in and out that people who are meandering around that precinct can see into the projects and see up, and that there are those kind of offers there, places to gather, places to sip wine, 
and you can look across other kind of rooftops. So there's a whole vertical roofscape that is really what Orchard Road is about. I, I think just drawing that idea back to the environment and that overlay that you did of uh, Orchard Road over Central Park. What about the many cities have resorted to introducing or reintroducing the element of water into the key areas. Seoul, for example, has uh, redone Chonggye Chong and created a whole new environment and a new reason to visit this part of the city. What if we apply that idea to Orchard? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm never allowed to spend that much money, but <coughs> um, if, you, if you develop uh, the world's longest swimming pool, uh, I think, and you could afford it, I think that would work instantly, automatically. From a, a appreciation perspective though, I would hope that you would improve Singapore River first because that's an asset that you already have, and that Orchard Road take a different kind of identity. So, something equally strong, but you already have uh, Marina Bay and Singapore River, which um, should be fantastic kind of assets, but then what is the counterpoint move? Okay, about 30 years ago, uh, I raised it with the School of Architecture in Singapore that uh, we should consider a continuous link, a pedestrian link, not necessarily at low road level, but on both sides of Orchard Road. Because uh, at that point in time, because I, I, I grew up around that area, right? Cane Hill, Scots Road area, and know a little bit about it. You know? the, the, the buildings at that time, uh, which started in earnest, uh, I think about, what, 40 years ago, were all single buildings, basically hotels, uh, shopping centers and high-rise styles. So I think what it lacked at that time was a, because, uh, a, a, a continuous link that you can take people to walk, uh, shoppers, tourists, visitors, from the top end, which, which I take it to be uh, approaching uh, what is now uh, uh, Napier Road. Was it Napier Road? Uh, before, before the Botanical Gardens, right down through the first part, cross uh, Scots Road, Patterson Road, up to the middle part to the Istana, and onwards to what I had hoped, where the Cafe Cinema was. And I think some of us, this is a separate issue, some of us had felt that uh, in terms of environment, in terms of planning, physical planning, the area which is now cluttered with uh, academic buildings should have definitely been left alone. And I, I always think about Central Park. Of course, albeit Central Park in New York uh, is much, much, much bigger. But it would have been an ideal place. Then I visited uh, Toronto 30 years ago and was struck by the fact that they... Uh, had done something like this because uh, in winter if any of you have visited Toronto and I visited in the middle of winter when the, when the lake was literally frozen with blocks of ice and uh, people still go along the main street uh, downtown Toronto I don't know where it was but it's about a, a basement down and that it, it was very good to be able to walk there completely uh, protected by the weather uh, no. To come back to Singapore, I think we haven't got the best of uh, uh, tropical countries. It's very hot, very unattractive. So I think I had hoped that they would have developed on both sides uh, of, of, of uh, Orchard Road. Uh, this kind of link, you see. Uh, I do agree with the speaker that uh, we, should have, we should retain the motor, motorway link. Uh, uh, and, and not uh, pedestrianize it at all. So this, this actually is my view, but I think until now, it's not particularly a very pedestrian-friendly kind of environment. Uh, that's my point. It can still be done, uh, but uh, it will take uh, a lot of effort. I agree. <laughs> no, just a, a funny response uh, to, to Chin B, because uh, when I was a young planner, I, we, I think at URA we did present this to uh, an idea of a continuous uh, pedestrian covered link 
And I think Mr. Pillay was the perm sec then, and I still remember Mr. Pillay's comment. And he said, Michael, are you trying to put the umbrella business out of business? <laughs> Interesting comment. <laughs> so I'll let, let you all think of the questions, but um, I'd like to also ask Phil uh, maybe two more questions. Uh, you said your favorite shopping street is Rambla. I think in Barcelona, many lessons uh, learned from it. But what uh, other streets in the world would you consider as great shopping streets or great urban villages? First question. Second question, there has been a, uh, we had a visiting fellow, uh, his name was, uh, his name is uh, Alex Washburn, from uh, Chief of Urban Design in New York City. And he felt that uh, Orchard Road needed urban attractions. Uh, of different scales. He quoted uh, a concept that he was uh, uh, thinking about for one of the Penn Street stations, uh, the idea of a hyperloop. Uh, he also cited perhaps a reverse bungee jump at Club Key, which is highly successful and experiential. So what is your view towards introducing urban attractions into Orchard? Having done, of course, uh, Universal, City Walk, etc. So two questions there. Yeah, if, if um, you, you have a chance to look at our website, <clears throat> my answer probably will contradict everything you see. Um, but I, 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 I kind of have this sort of reverence that I think Orchard Road will become. Um, and I, I don't think that you need um, uh, temporary uh, attractions or gimmicks that simply will go away. Because you know, every city in the world has put a Ferris wheel on its waterfront, for instance. Um, it's okay for a few months, um, and then it's the same as every other city. Um, Orchard Road is too important, I think, to fill with uh, things that really are not contextual. I, I think that there's a tremendous design to be pursued because Orchard Road represents the most important street in Singapore. So it's really about, uh, about finding what is Singapore all about and, and, and the people within Singapore. So a, your swimming pool um, or a Central Park kind of solution, which can have follies within it, I think that's much more the way to go rather than constantly trying to fill it with things that will go out of fashion very, very quickly. Um, and then in terms of um, uh, great retail streets and environments, um, as I get older, um, I'm really uh, focusing on uh, more intimate and organic type of environments. Um, the back streets of Kyoto, any back street in Tokyo, for instance, um, I think that's where you find the inspiration because every few steps you find something completely unique. And that uniqueness is a combination not just of stores itself, but little things around the neighborhood which somebody has crafted perfectly. You know, the, uh, a friend of mine um, works in uh, Shibuya, so <clears throat> he'll, he'll take me to uh, this little small Japanese restaurant where people are kind of scurrying back and forth. Interesting shops and all that. But the most unique aspect of that is something that is intentionally designed. Um, uh, he always uh, puts me in this seat. He sits over there. Um, and it's a kind of a triangular window that's actually at the base of this restaurant. And what's really interesting about that window um, and why it re represents the life in that area is you see um, uh, only from the knee down um, of office ladies scurrying to lunch and coffee. That's usually his seat, but he, he, he allows me to take possession of that seat, seat when I visit. But it's those kind of idiosyncratic moments that are intentional, that really capture the life of, of that street. And I think that that, uh, uh, that sense of uniqueness is really what's exciting and interesting. Not the big generic malls, not the big generic streets anymore. You know, um, the the, the talk of pedestrianization has been brought up again and again, and I'm um, equally uh, guilty of perhaps over-belaboring the point about how important it is. But, you know, we, we, the only reason that we push the idea is that we feel that the walkability of Orchard Road is a major issue. Um, you know, there are no other major streets in the world which are as hard to cross. You know, and if you're a tourist here, you know, uh, from Shaw House to get to Ion, 
it requires two underpasses and or to um, you know to any of the other places on Orchard Road. Uh, the Scotts Road, Patterson Road crossing is a uh, is a major block almost mm -hmm. to the flow of Orchard Road. And um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm glad to hear that URA and STB have are looking at scramble crossings further down Orchard Road. But I've always, you know, um, I'm trying to sell this here. Is the, put, put a big scramble crossing at Patterson and Scotts Road. But <clears throat> uh, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about it slowing traffic down. And, but I really felt that that was the point of this, you know, is that we don't need a high speed traffic down Orchard Road. It should be a place where people take their time and make their way down, even if it's one lane of traffic. So, you know, what, what do you think of, uh, and oh, the other thing I was gonna say was, um, I like the idea of your, your side streets, and I can almost imagine the malls becoming the side streets of Orchard Road, because, you know, rather than having large department stores, or, you know, they should be a little, they should be a little more, bit more experiential, and people should have interesting things to discover within. I, I think it's just a comment. I, I think those are really good comments. <clears throat> the, um, again, going back to Shibuya for a second, I, um, uh, arguably the Shibuya crossing is one of the biggest attractions in the world, and it's just watching people cross, right? So I think you have the same opportunities here. So again, when we, you know, when sort of started by saying people attract people, I think that's really the fundamental for solving a lot of issues in a more um, organic way rather than forcing something that doesn't belong. So I, I agree with Right, so I, I think that all nicely sums up uh, today's conversation. I think Phil had talked about walkability and connectivity, and this was again highlighted by Mark and how important it is. And he also talked about the idea of breaking malls down to create urban villages and always emphasizing on the issue of community. Um, but always, uh, I think, at the back of Phil's mind, he's talked about that of whatever we want to insert into our projects, where, wherever they are, that they should be experiential, I guess you create moments that are relevant to the people, Instagrammable moments even, but no matter what, they should be truly authentic and local experiences. And I think, uh, as he also mentioned, push the edges of technology, think through new mixes of users, whether it's horizontally or all vertically. So with that, uh, quick summary. Thank you very much, Phil Kim from Jody Partnership, and thank you everybody for attending, today, to attending today's lecture. Please put your hands together. <laughs> Thank you.